What's going on guys, it's Jack Gales, 1875 here and we've got another one of my East German football and stories videos. Today it's all about Ferverts, the club of the East German army. We're going to be talking about them as a club, sort of the different places they moved, their story, the East German army itself because we need to know about that for the video and why Ferverts wasn't as successful as other army clubs in the Warsaw Pact countries like Bulgaria or the Soviet Union. So I really hope you enjoy the video, guys. Am I going to jump straight in? Aus der Hand des Ministers für nationale Verteidigung empfängt der Kommandeur die Fahne des Regiments, das Symbol der Ehre des Truppenteils bei der Verteidigung der Arbeiter und Bauernmacht. Der feierliche Spur. So what you guys just saw there was an East German propaganda film showing the army in the 50s. Now the National Volkes Army, or the National People's Army, is really important to our story here. So in the aftermath of World War II, East Germany fell under the Soviet sector of control. East Germany was carved up and East Germany found itself under the control of the Communist Soviet Union. And East Germany was a lot quicker to rearm itself than West Germany was. The Americans and the British were funny about West Germany rearming itself, whereas the Soviets wanted East Germany to rapidly rearm itself. And this was seen in two ways by the population. Some were happy to see a strong Prussian military tradition-like army, whilst others were a bit scared that history was going to be doomed to repeat itself. Now, the East German army was one of the strongest and most disciplined within the Eastern Bloc, and they reckon if East and West Germany fought each other without interfering from other any other countries, and it was just a normal like, land battle, air force battle sort of thing, with no nuclear weapons, East Germany could overrun West Germany. East Germany's army looked German, it looked like Prussian military tradition, and Whilst there was a bit of scepticism after the war, a lot of people in East Germany soon became very, very proud of their army. And even to this day, a lot of East Germans say that the Nationale Volkes Armee is still better than the Bundeswehr, which is the, no the modern German army, because the Bundeswehr looks too American. And that's what a lot of East Germans say. Now, the reason the army is so key to our story is because in Eastern Bloc countries, army and military power played an important part of the propaganda machine, and this fed into football. Of course, in the Soviet Union, you had CSK Moscow, CSK Sofia in Bulgaria, and Stoya Bucharest in Romania were all successful. Now, Fervets didn't find themselves overly successful in East Germany, and that's what this video is going to be about. Why was Fervets not as successful? Why did they get moved about a lot? And basically, the story of why East Germany's army didn't get a good football team. Let's move on to it. So, guys, we're going to move on to the football side of things now. We're going to talk about the most confusing part first. I thought I'd get that out of the way, which is the name and location changes. Now, luckily, Fervets didn't change their name all too much over the years, which is great. But as we know... East German teams do like to change their names rather a lot, as we learned from the Stahl Eisenhüttenstadt video and the Leipzig Derby video. So, Fürwitz first began life in the early 50s and was one of the first centralised sports clubs to be formed in Eastern Germany. Now, after the war, as part of denazification, the Soviets came in and banned all organised sport and a lot of teams were disbanded for going against uh, the new Soviet rulers wish wishes if you like you know the political stuff so Fervats was formed as an army sports club now it was originally formed as SV Casinerta Volkspolizei Fervats um I won't say that again but basically that means sports club forward barracked people's police because the Casinerta Volkspolizei was a very early form of the East German Army. So that basically means barrack people's police. So it was the armed wing of the police. And that was the earliest form of armed forces East Germany had. And that um, rather confusingly became a split identity club because you can really say that Dynamo Dresden can trace their roots back to um, Fürwitz, Kassenerta, Volks, Polizei, Leipzig as well. So that was founded in Leipzig and you know, and admitted into the Oberliga in 1954. And they were okay. They were a sort of decent mid-table club. Then the decision was taken that the police team would be moved to Dresden and that the newly formed National Volkes Army should have a team in the capital. So Fürwitz was moved up to Berlin. And that is where Fürwitz stayed for most of 
their time. Now, they changed their name a few times in Berlin. They were FZ Fürwerts, and then they were ZSK, which means Zentral Sport Club Army, which is the German version of CSK, which is, as you guys know, means Central Army Sports Club. So they, they sort of copied them. They went Sovietified a bit and copied the Soviets and the Bulgarians and... That's when Fervitz had the most successful period as a club, which we'll talk about later. So they stayed in Berlin for quite a long time, and then eventually, as BFC Dynamo became ever stronger, it was decided, no, the police and the Stasi are going to have their successful team in the capital. So Fervitz got booted out to Frankfurt and Der Oder, which, you know, th- there's various reasons. Nobody really knows why properly, because... Frankfurt didn't really have that much military presence, whilst Berlin was the headquarters of the army. But anyway, and became Army Sportverein Fürwärts, or Army Sport Club Fürwärts. They changed their name twice up there. So they were ASV, they were ASVV, and then they were ASV, which is Army Sport Club Fürwärts Frank, Frankfurt and the Oder. So there's a lot of mouthfuls there. I'm, not, I'm never saying Fürwärts casting there to folks, Polizei ever again. <laughs> I'll get a sore tongue. So that is. Basically, all the name and location changes. They went from Leipzig, which is also Dynamo Dresden, as they find their roots in this club. They then went up to Berlin, stayed in Berlin for quite a long time. Now, there was a bit of a split-off club um, at Stelsund, which was a big naval base up in the north of Germany, East Germany. And we, do, we, do, we don't talk about Fürwitz Stelsund because they're not really important. But there was, a, there was another little bit of a split-off club there and then eventually found themselves in Frankfurt and the Oda where the successor club which again we'll talk about later finds itself today so I thought I'd get that out of the way now we're going to move on to the successful period as a club in Berlin and why they weren't as successful as the other big army teams in the Eastern Bloc. Now we're going to talk about Fürwärts, the most successful period in Berlin, the trophy hall in total, and how they compare to other Eastern Bloc army clubs. So this is going to be a long section of the video, but it's a necessary um, section of the video, and I'll try and split it up a bit. So first of all, we're going to talk about Fürwärts and the most successful period in Berlin. So during the 60s, Fürwärts were a very, very successful Oberliga side and they won five titles that was their most successful point they won five titles not consecutively they were on separate years but during the 60s they were the big team in East Germany and it looked like East Germany was going the way of the Soviet Union because at that time CSK Moscow were doing quite well in the Soviet Union so it looked like East Germany was really going in step with the Soviet Union in terms of that with the army club being the most successful and yeah Fürwitz enjoyed a lot of success at that point the lowest they ever came in the 60s was third in the league so they were up there they were always a solid top three side and like I said they got those five Oberliga titles as well and during the Berlin days they had some fantastic players most of the East German national team was made up of Fürwitz players and they really were the poster boys of East German football and the East German army now, this dominant streak came an end when they were eventually uh, turfed out to Frankfurt, and that's that. So I'm now going to move on to talk about their trophy hall. So we're now going to talk about Fürwitz's trophy hall, and they had a quite an impressive trophy hall, I would say. They had six DDR Oberliga titles and two FDG Papal Cows. Um, so two East German Cups which isn't bad that's nothing to be sniffed at so in total they had eight major pieces of silverware now what you've got to remember is East German football was usually dominated by one team based on who had carried the most political favour so having a lot of silverware wasn't really the norm in East Germany and six league titles and two cups is more than some teams in the Bundesliga have right now. I can name a few examples. Both Berlin sides, Hertha and Union, have less than that. I'm pretty sure teams like Kiln and um, Arminia Bielefeld have less than that as well. So, by modern standards for a top league side to have that sort of silverware hall is impressive. And by East German standards, it was impressive as well. Like I said, you've got to remember that certain clubs dominated a long period. So, six titles, two cups. So, their, their, last, their last cup was their last major piece of silverware. That came in 1970, the FDA Gaby Pokal. And that was that. And like I was saying, the Berlin periods where they won five of those titles, they won a title as, um, like I said, when they were in Leipzig as well. So, 
they, they had all that silverware and that was a decent amount of silverware for a club like them and you've, what you've got to remember is these players were also doing their national service at the time as well so they had to balance up military training with um, playing football so it's, it is really impressive and it is honestly a good achievement for the club to have that amount of silverware but it's not as good as the silverware hall of some of the army clubs in other countries and that's what we're going to talk about next so we'll move on to that so we're now going to compare Fairverts to the army clubs of three other eastern bloc countries I've picked the Soviet Union Bulgaria and Romania. So we're going to start off with the Soviet Army team, which was CSKA Moscow. The CSKA Moscow weren't that much more successful than Fervets, but they did have a more sustained period of dominance and had better European showings. So CSKA Moscow have a total of 12 pieces of major silverware in the Soviet era. That's seven Soviet League titles and then five Soviet Cups. That was, again, a decent silverware hall. They have three more Cups than Fervets and one more League title. And that sort of shows you in the Soviet Union, the Dynamo sides became more popular as well. Now, Dynamo was the club of the militia, militia, as it was known, which is the Soviet police and the KGB, which is the Soviet secret police. So the so the KGB clubs like Dynamo Minsk, Dynamo Kiev and Dynamo Moscow were always more sort of successful. But CSKA did have a sort of more sustained period of dominance in the Soviet league than Fervets had in the Oberliga. So there you go, we're now going to move on to CSK Sofia. We're now going to compare Fervets to CSK Sofia. Now CSK Sofia hail from the Bulgarian capital. Bulgaria was one of the Eastern Bloc's best footballing nations, of course. Big name that you guys will all know, Haristio Stoichkov. And CSK Sofia have a whopping total of 40 pieces of major silverware in the communist era. They won 27 A-class, as it was known in the communist era titles, 27 and 14 Bulgaria, communist Bulgaria cups so during the communist era. So there you go, 40 pieces of uh, major silverware, which shows, I mean, that Bulgarian football was completely dominated by the army. And I suppose communist Bulgaria was sort of a military dictatorship. It was one of the last uh, communist countries to fall. And it was one of the most hardline sort of Stalinist ones as well. So just goes to show that... Um, the army were popular in CSK in um, Bulgaria, and CSK was one of the most supported, and still is one of the most supported clubs in Bulgaria today. So there you go, forty pieces of major silver makes um, four versus uh, six leagues and two cups seem quite insignificant. So there we go. We're now going to move on to Stoya Bucharest. Now we're going to compare Fervets to our last army team, which is Romania's Stoia Bucharest. Now, Romania, during the Ceausescu communist period, was a very successful football nation. Of course, Georgia Hadji is one of the names that I, we could pick out of heart. There's loads of others as well. Now, Stoia have 30 pieces of major silverware. They have 12 Romanian league titles in the communist period. They had 17 cups, but it doesn't end there. There's one more thing to add on to the pile, which is, of course, the Champions League or European Cup, as it was known then. They won one Champions League in the 80s, which was they're the only one of very few Eastern Bloc teams to have ever won it. The only Romanian team to ever win a European trophy, which is impressive if you think about it. So there you go. Out of the three, I think Stoya are probably the most successful because I could imagine the Bulgarian league was very corrupt and not very high quality. So Stoya, you could really look out of the four as the most successful. CSK Moscow are successful now, but that's post-communism. It's not communist, so we can't count it. And Fervert's, like I said, have been put to shame by Stoya and CSK there. So there you go, 30, major, 30 pieces of major silverware for Stoya. 12 league titles, 17 cups and a European Cup as well. So we're now going to move on to analysing what this all meant in comparison to Fervert's. So as you can see, three of East Germany's fellow Warsaw Pact countries had better army teams. I know CSK Moscow were only marginally better, 
but they were better and stayed in one place and were regularly challenging at the top of the Soviet League, which, as we'll discover about Furwitz later on, they didn't really do that in East Germany. So it is all to do with what institutions were valued higher in the Eastern Bloc and how liberal countries were as well. Now, in the Soviet Union, which East Germany was forever copying, the Dynamo... KGB and police clubs became more popular, they were the more widely supported clubs. So East Germany followed suit and that's how BFC Dynamo in Berlin and Dynamo Dresden became more successful. In Romania and Bulgaria, the army was very popular, so the Stoya and CSK won many league titles, as we saw. Now, in the more liberal countries like Hungary, Poland and Czechoslovakia, Clubs didn't really have connections to the states. The most successful team in the communist period in Hungary was really Honved um, Budapest and Ferenc Varos from Budapest, who didn't really have any connections to state functionaries. Poland, of course, we all know the big names from Polish football. They did sort of have connections, but they didn't. And then Czechoslovakia... They were all pre-war clubs like Slavia and Sparta. So what you can see is the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, East Germany and Romania were all, the sports clubs were all changed to match communism. And in East Germany and the Soviet Union, it was the secret and the normal police clubs like the Dynamo clubs that were the most, pop, that were the most popular and the highest performing clubs. In Bulgaria and Romania, who were on the Nazi side in the war, so had to obviously have denazification um, take place and have new clubs. It was the army clubs, gave was the most popular. But in Hungary, Poland and Czechoslovakia, who had been victims of the war and then became Eastern Bloc satellite states after, they kept their old pre-war clubs. So like I said, you know, you've got Ligia Warsaw and all that in Poland, Slavia and Sparta, Prague in Czechoslovakia and some of the old Slovakian teams like uh, Slova and Bratislava. And then Hungary, you had the big Budapest clubs. So it just goes to show how different Eastern Bloc countries did it. And that's that. Because East Germany copied the Soviet Union mirror image, the Dynamo clubs were the ones that were always going to be successful because Dan Dynamo Moscow, Kiev, Dynamo Kiev and uh, Dynamo Minsk were the big successful teams in the Soviet Union. So it stands to reason that East Germany was going to follow suit. And then in Romania and Bulgaria, they're both quite very militaristic leaders who liked the army. So that there you go. We're now going to move on to Fur versus decline and the rise of the Dynamo clubs and how that affected Fur versus. So now we're going to talk about the decline of Furverts um, and why this happened, the main factor being the big Dynamo club. So Furverts Berlin won the FDGB Pokal in 1970, the East German Cup, and that turned out to be their last piece of major silverware ever. So Furverts Berlin, a year later, were told, right, you're moving to Frankfurt. Now there's Loads of reasons that have been cited for this, but nobody really knows why, and I don't think we're ever going to know the truth. So, Furverts were forced out to Frankfurt, and I think the main reason, in my theory, I tend to go with this theory, is Milka was getting jealous of the army doing so well, whilst the two Dynamo clubs were struggling. BFC were a sort of mid-table Oberliga team, and Dresden kept coming second and third behind Furvert. So I think Milka was getting upset that his Dynamo clubs and the Volkspolizei leadership were getting sad that their Dynamo clubs weren't doing as well as the army. Because as we know, the army and the police in these countries always fall out with each other. So Furvert's got moved out to a regional backwater where there was already a well-established football club, Stalais and Hüttenstadt. As we learned, Furvert soon gained a very famous fan, the East German Prime Minister, Willi Stoff, who'd served in the military for quite a long time. So Furvert's got moved out to Frankfurt and it didn't exactly go well for them. The 70s wasn't a good uh, period for them. They spent most of the 70s in the East German second flight and only really made it back up into the DDR Oberliga in time for East Germany collapsing. And we're going to talk about their post 
then the post reunification history later on in the video. So the rise of the two Dinamo clubs really contributed to this. Dinamo Dresden became massively successful in the 70s alongside another state favoured club, Magdeburg, and Lokomotiv Leipzig started to become really successful in the 70s as well. These were all state favoured clubs and the army began to fall away and they got moved out to Frankfurt to get put out of the way. Uh, so that clubs like Magdeburg and Dinamo Dresden could improve. And then, of course, the big club in the capital became BFC Dinamo Milka's um, showpiece Stasi team. And as we know, they went on to win 10 East German titles and become the record East German champions. So that was really an issue that happened. And I think the other contribution was the Soviet Union's football landscape. Like I said in my section, comparing Fiverrts to CSK Moscow... The Dynamo clubs became very popular in the Soviet Union, especially Dynamo Kiev. So Milka obviously wanted to copy his best pals in the Soviet Union. And that is why East Germany began to have this transition towards the police and the secret police having bigger and better clubs. Now, in other sports, Frankfurt, Fervitz Frankfurt continued to excel. They um, were good at boxing, judo, basketball, ice hockey, sports like that. But... Dynamo Dresden and BFC Dynamo became the two big clubs and this was just the thing that the secret police had more power and like I said, Fürwitz found themselves in the East German second flight for most of the 70s and only really got back into comfortable top league football in time for East Germany collapsing so we're now going to talk about the post vendor and what's happened to Fürwitz since so now we're going to talk about what happened to Fürwitz after their dip in the 70s and then what's happened to the club after the reunification and what's the state of the club now. So after their dip in the 70s and their relegation to the second division and their getting moved out to Frankfurt, they did bounce back for this and ended up in the Oberliga again in the 80s where they became a solid mid-table club, made the occasional little foreign to Europe always got a decent decent few rounds in the cup and yeah just always occupied solid mid table in the Oberliga around 6th and 7th after reunification things went downhill now like most clubs after reunification they scrambled to sort of ditch their communist identity so even though the army was still backing them after reunification they renamed themselves Victoria Frankfurt and the Roder now after the reunification happened properly, there was no East German army to support them anymore. So they completely changed their name and became Erste FC Frankfurt. So after all those years starting out as Fürwerts, Kassenerta, Volkspolizei in Leipzig, they found themselves without any of their army heritage left. So Erste FC Frankfurt is the successor to Fürwitz. That is what Fürwitz is now. So basically, it should be Fürwitz Frankfurt, but it isn't. It's Earth FC Frankfurt. Now, unlike other communist countries like the ones we mentioned, you know, so Russia and Bulgaria, where CSK, Sofia and CSK, Moscow still had very close connections to the army and Stoya got bought over privately and are now very successful in Romania still, Fervets found themselves in a position where the Bundeswehr didn't want anything to do with them because it was all about German reconciliation and trying to ditch the communist past. So that's why they had to shed the army identity. They now find themselves in the depths of football and obscurity playing in the Brandenburg Verbandsliga, which is the German 6th Division, the regional 6th Division, the Brandenburg State League, and they've never really found themselves at a higher level than that, you know, they they make occasional runs into the Pokal if they win the Brandenburg Lands Pokal, but even they begin to dry up now, given that they seem to have the, uh, it just seemed to be a yearly tradition that Erste FC Frankfurt find themselves pumped out by Babelsberg or Furstenwalde or Energie Koppers, so Frankfurt, Fürwitz really find themselves in a horrible position now, but they don't have any army connections whatsoever maybe someday someday will invest and they'll bring it all back like what happened with Stoya or even CSK Sofia but that's the main difference that in Bulgaria and Russia in particular CSK Sofia and CSK Moscow are still very successful clubs whilst Fervets find themselves with a new name all the way down in the amateur leagues which is interesting but that's German football for you. That's what happened when East German football collapsed. So, we're now going to cut to the outro. 
So that brings us to the end of another one of my East German football and stories videos, guys. I wouldn't be doing these without your support, so thank you so, so much. So this has been the story of Fervert's uh, the Club of the East German Army. And, you know, they never really did become all that successful. Um, unlike other army clubs, like I discussed, CSK Sofia, which I might even make its own video because their history is brilliant. I might branch into other um, Eastern Bloc countries if you'd like to see that. Tell me. Um, CSK Sofia needs to get its own video. So you just see that in East Germany, the Stasi had such a grip on everything that the Dynamo clubs just became the bigger and better clubs. And, they, you know, Fervitz were successful early on in East Germany, but the more the Stasi tightened their grip on the country, the more popular the, and successful the Dynamo clubs became. So there you go. And it's always a fascinating view, way to look at history through football, and it's a more engaging way. And that's why I keep bringing these videos out. But like I said, could not do them without your support, guys. This one uh, was one of the easier ones to make, I say, apart from going down rabbit holes looking at the history of uh, the Fuhrwerts casting there to folks Polizei Leipzig and also that's a mouthful to say so yeah you know it, it, these do take a lot of research and without your support on them out the people that retweet them and I put them on Twitter out the folk that leave likes and nice comments and just without you guys I wouldn't be making these videos because they do take ages to make and it's a lot of effort and a lot of research that gets put into these videos but I love doing it you know I love sharing the histories of these because it is so interesting I hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you learned about something about football and not just in East Germany but we went in um, Warsaw packed wide today really really do hope you enjoy this guys really hope you learned something today and yeah that's that one of east germany's sort of lesser known football and stories again so really hope you enjoyed that guys remember to smash that like button you know what to do smash that like button if you enjoyed the content if you're swinging by the channel for the first time please subscribe because i do so much unique football and content that you won't find anywhere else you know i i don't just talk about East German football, I do Hibs stuff as well, I do, well, I'm thinking about branching into other Eastern Bloc uh, football, so, yeah, keep your eyes peeled, guys, and if you're, like I said, if you're new, please subscribe, it means a lot to see that folk are coming across me and enjoying the content, and I will see you all very, very soon, Jack out.